Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining. We've had a very um, long break, but God willing, I'm hoping that from now on, we're going to be doing this on a weekly basis, on a set hour. Um, I think it's going to be Thursdays, usually at one o'clock, and um, I will keep everyone posted, but I am, God willing, my granddaughter is feeling so much better and progressing, and I freed up, and I could totally um, take it to do it once a week and teach. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that today I had a, I had a visit from Joy Harari, who's here for her brother-in-law's, you know, um, Shiva and for the Arayat. And I realized how wonderful it is to see people face to face to, I, I wish I could teach face to face. I wish I could, um, be able to, um, work and do Avodah with women face to face. It is totally invaluable. And I saw that just by having Joy over here and being able to talk to her and listen to her and see, you know, where she's at and where she's progressing and 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 how she's developing. And um, I definitely got a feeling of, wow, I wish we were able to learn face to face. So I'm just putting it out there at Atzon to be able to teach face to face. Um, OK, yeah, I'm starting with an avodah that I had on myself that I did between me and my teacher. Um, and it was an avodah that was very difficult for me to look at. Though the minute I'm able to look at it, I'm able to know what my next level of growth is. And we're always trying to reach our next level of growth. We're now in the days between Pesach and Shavuot, and we're constantly climbing up towards Matan Torah. And towards Matan Torah is, is a constant growth. Every day we're different people, we're changing, we're evolving, we're trying to take on us, you know, different mitzvot, different avodot. And um, I, I thought to myself, this is a perfect time to be able to um, open up and explore and see something that I would like to work on as far as I'm concerned. So before, Michal Levona was sick before she was diagnosed with a tumor. I had a personality that was very happy and upbeat and very, um, I would wake up in the morning and there would always be songs running through my head. And I'd experience the world as a very vibrant place. Um, and that was the way it used to be on automatic. That was like automatic pilot. And then Michal Levona was diagnosed and we went through hard times in the hospital and um, trying to um, not, not knowing whether she's going to live or not, not knowing what um, treatment is going to work, you know, doctors, everyone being very question marked and not knowing the direction they're going to go. There were so many, um, there were so many, uh, how do you say that in English? Like there were theories about how it could go, but no one really knew. It was too it was too rare. And I found myself on automatic pilot just constantly functioning. Now, the functioning and the action that I was taking was really very good because it stopped me from thinking. I didn't realize, I didn't know, um, you know, what's, I, I, I wasn't taking the time out to emotionally figure out what's happening with me. I was on doing mode. I was on doing mode. And then, um, after four months, we're home, Michali's home. She's in the hospital once a week. And I realized that I am waking up in the morning and there's no more song in my heart. And I'm looking at the world and the world is black and white for me. It's not, the, 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 the colors are not vibrant. And I discovered that there's something inherent in me that was very basic that I lost, that I lost in, in these four months. And it's something that I really wanted to return back to my life. So the avodah that I did is as follows. First of all, the realization that I wanted to be different, that I want to be able to um, retrieve the happiness and the vibrancy that I had in my life. So the question that I was asked is, was, was that happiness like something inherent 
or and, and and in other words, was this happiness something that came from the inside or from the outside? And it, it means that are we going to allow things from the outside of us, right? Whether it's our children, whether it's our husbands, whether it's our grandchildren, with our parents, which which is like many different situations that we're in, right? From the outside, are we going to allow them to tell us whether we're going to be happy or not, or are we going to be able to generate the happiness from within, regardless of what's happening on the outside, and be able to find our own happiness? It's like, let's say the weather outside. When I look outside and I see that it's snowing, so what's happening on the outside dictates what I'm going to be doing on the inside. In other words, what kind of coat I'm going to wear, and what kind of boots, and what kind of leggings, and am I going to go, you know, am I going to go with an umbrella? Am I not going to go with an umbrella? So there, there's weather and outside, and it di dictates to me, right, what what happens to me on the inside. So we want to reach a place where we're going to be able to internally generate our happiness, and it's not going to be dependent on, you know, my granddaughter went up 100 grams. She didn't go up 100 grams. Um, she is. She was hospitalized three times. She's hospitalized one time. She's not hospitalized at all. Um, it, it's, not, it's not going to be dependent on my daughter called me. My daughter got a job. My son, you know, got married, didn't get married, is still looking around, et cetera, et cetera. Our happiness is not going to be dependent on anything on the outside. And then I told my teacher that something in me was dim, right? And she said, because you are seeing something on the outside and there are sentences that I say in my head and that I tell myself that, that are dimming me. And she asked, what are those sentences that are dimming you, that are creating like this, um, also me not waking up in the morning with a song in my head and the fact that my, uh, the light dimmed in my life. Like I'm, I'm functioning sort of in black and white rather than in color. So I, I, I thought for a while and I said, you know what? There are sentences that I am dimming myself with. And what are those sentences? Um, first of all, so, so the baby is home and, and she's growing very slow. And because like, let's say I had, I had a, a, a grandson born two and a half months ago and he weighs 12 pounds now at this point and um or 11 pounds whatever and uh Michaela when I was born nine months ago and she weighs 11 pounds so at this point the doctors are saying she needs to gain weight otherwise it's going to affect her cognitively because there's there's just nowhere to get the calories from and no matter how many calories they give her she's burning it all so immediately the sentences that dim my life and in, in my head is okay, what's going to be with her cognitively? She's not, physically, she's not going to develop normally. What's going to happen in the future? How is she going to manage? Um, you know, when is the food going to start? Um, when is the food going to start being absorbed in her? Um, is she going to be able to go to first grade, et cetera, et cetera? So, um, on the one hand, I want to constantly think, okay, we're back to normal life. Once a week, we're in the hospital. She's taking her chemo every day. She's taking her biological, but really inside, I don't feel like we passed the hurdle of, um, we passed the hurdle of this is behind us. And, um, and then, and then my teacher asked me until it's not behind me a hundred percent, you will worry and your happiness in your life will be diminished. So I told her, you know, it shows me. At, on a certain level, the level of my emuna, because it's very easy to have emuna when things are going well, when things are more or less functioning out, our kids having the regular kids problem, and I'm having the regular issues with my husband, and, and you know, my mother is getting older, and my father as well getting older, and Alzheimer's and whatever, and those things are um, par for the course of life, that I take regularly, and I know it's from Hashem, and it's in his hands, and all of a sudden, I was hit with Michal Levona's tumor, illness, and, and I crashed, I crashed. Um, 
And I want to be able to have the emuna. But what I find is that I want to have some certainty and then I'm going to have the emuna. I, I want you to tell me that, you know, it is going to be okay or 80% is going to be okay. Or like, just, just tell me something. Let me grab onto something. And I realized that the only, that the way my emuna works is if I just know of some certainty some way down the road, then my emuna is going to work. And I'm not happy. That is a level I want to grow from. So it, I realized that I have a picture in my head of a, a woman that has emuna, and I'm disappointed with myself because I feel like there's nothing certain. Like unless I have certainty, then I then then my emuna is going to be on on a on a better level, on 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 a higher level. So when I'm disappointed on myself, I so I I I beat up myself and I am. Uh, very critical of myself and I flagellate myself of, you know, you should be on a better level than Emunah, so things are not certain, so everything is in God's hands and why are you worried and, you know, like, why can't you reach that level um, in order for you to regain your happiness? So I realized that when, when we are on this journey of life and we're trying to grow there's always going to be a lower level and a higher level. And the lower level, we could never, the lower, the lower level is a level we're at. And there's a lower level than that. That's where we were yesterday. And there's a level today. And then there's a higher level, the next level. Now, when I'm in the level that I am, I cannot make that level, I can't blacken it. I can't make it dark just like I was doing now. Like, what kind of woman are you? Why don't you have a Muna, et cetera? Because the level that I'm at is where, uh, is, 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 is the, the level that I came up from the rung below. I cannot continuously going on. And when I get onto the next level, there's gonna be something that I'm gonna want, that, that you, there's a, another peg in the journey or another actually rung in the ladder that I'm gonna to wanna to go up. I need to be able to be very, very compassionate and kind to the level that I am now. This is the level I am now, and I have to give it a good word. I have to give it a good name. So the the name that I gave the level that I'm at is first of all that I'm a very caring and loving grandmother. But also I'm a woman that that goes back a couple of steps and I like to see the big picture. That's who I am now. And that is a very important quality. And it's a quality that um, it's actually also a quality that, how do we know if a quality is good or not? We need to think, do I want to pass this quality on to my children? If it's a quality I want to pass on to my children, it's, it's a good quality. So yes, it, a quality of seeing things like the bigger picture and from higher up and seeing at a distance, it is a good quality and it's something that I do want to pass on to my children. And it, it stands me in very good stead in the work that I do, like in organizing parties, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do I know that it's time to go up to the next level? It's when I feel uncomfortable in the level that I am, not because I made it black and not because I darkened it and not because I criticized it, but because I feel like I am ready now to go on to the next level. I could, because it means that it's like the shoe started to get a little bit tight. The shoe started to get a little tight. Okay, it's time to buy another shoe. And we don't, but the, the shoe that we had before served us very well. And it was really good for us. And it encased our feet and it protected us and it served a purpose. So that purpose, I'm not gonna black it. I'm gonna say, this is where I was. But now there is, there is another, my, my shoe, my, my foot grew larger and it's time for another shoe. And I'm gonna get myself another shoe to be able to, uh, to know that it's gonna serve me better. Okay, so every level, there's a level below it. There's a level on top of it. And every level is, um, is um, valuable and needs to be given its kavod. Needs, and, and that's the place where we are now, right? Um, so, so instead of saying, I don't have good emuna, saying I have a characteristics of looking at everything, you know, from, from a very, very broad range and and, um, and, and now I wanna go up to the next level. Now the future is very important for my granddaughter. 
right? And uh, it's important to me that my granddaughter have a good future. And um, and I know I know that this little baby is going to one day have to go to school, and and uh, she's going to have to function in society, and she is going to want to be beautiful and tall and 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 competent and capable. Um, and the the the, the so. Um, so, so I, I, I want to realize that I came from a very good place. I came from, and, and we always come from good places, right? We, 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 we tend to think that if we don't beat ourselves up, if we're not critical of ourselves, we don't grow, but we have to have a good eye on ourselves because man, humanity, man always wants to grow. And the strength of his desire to grow is much more stronger than criticism. Now, I, I, as I said, how do I know that I want to grow? I'll feel less comfortable on the level. Like a baby, a baby goes through a couple of levels, right? Um, it, it, first, it lies down and it waves his hands and feet. That's one level. And then the baby is able to flip over and it's another level. And then be on all fours and that's another level. And then like there's always a movement. We need to realize that we are always desiring movement. So there's no need for us to beat ourselves up or to uh, self-flagellate ourselves, okay? And the minute I reach the next level, I don't slide back, right? I don't slide back. The, the, next, the level that I attain is the level that that becomes my reality. So every level is good. And now at this point, I'm saying I'm ready to grow. So I ask myself two questions, right? The first question is, um, what did I discover about myself? So I, as I said before, I discovered about myself that I'm a person that likes to go to a high vantage point and see the whole big picture. And I want certainty. And I want to know that things are going to, you know, evolve and develop and, 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 and flower to be really good for my granddaughter. And then the next question we ask ourselves is, what do I want to build in me? How can I go to the next level, right? Um, I'm seeing the big picture. And usually, um, let's say when I uh, plan a party or when I plan anything, I have a lot of control. I have a lot of control or I have the illusion that I have control, right? But really, I don't have control. And I realized that I discovered in me that not having control takes away my simchat chayim, takes away my happiness. I think there's there's a word for it in French and it's joie de vivre. I don't know what the word of for it is, is in English. Like Rini, what would you say? Like simchat chaim is a joy of life. Would you say that? Inner peace, inner peace, maybe inner peace. No, it's I not. mean it's more than inner peace. It's a joyful uh, simchat chaim, yeah. like a joyful life. I don't know. There's not really a word for it in English. I don't think. Right. So, right. There's there's a joy joy of life that I that I want. And, um, and I realized that when I don't have control, my joy of life, my simchat chaim, um, like leaks away from me. So the question is, what is easier to have control over? What happens on the outside of us or what happens on the inside of us, right? Or to control what's going on in our heads. It is much easier to control what is happening outside of us. Like um, my, my, my son doesn't have a job. So, you know, I try to like prep him and teach him and do it this way and do it that way. Um, and uh, you call up people and, you know, try to pull strings, et cetera. Like I have the worry that my son doesn't have a job. And then I calm down my worry by immediately going into action and doing, doing things. Um, my daughter is not married and I, um, start, you know, calling and telling her how to dress and telling her what to eat and telling her that she should lose weight, et cetera, et cetera, because it's much easier to control my outside world than my inner world, right? So, so the outside world is much, much easier to control. However, the point that I reached in my life is I want to control what's going on in my inner world, right? Like um, my friend, let's say it was Lagba Omer, and her son went to the um, to the bonfire to the kumzits, and then um, 
and and he wasn't answering the phone and he wasn't calling back and 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 she it was already late at night so I start imagining like what could have happened to him and did he get burned do I get into my car and drive to see that my son is okay at the last moment of fat or do I try to work on the thoughts in my head to be able to bring myself to a place of um to a place of, of, of being on an even keel now I could so, so it's much easier for me to get in the car to drive to see he's okay uh, to, to embarrass him in the in the interim you know but um that is called controlling the outside world controlling our children our husbands rather than trying to control our thoughts so the next level for me when i can't control the outside world is i want to have control over th something much harder my mind and what goes on in my head what do i want actually to happen first of all how do we do that and what do i want to happen i want to reach a point where in my head my mind is like a white pristine clean piece of paper i want to be able to live in my head without jumping to conclusions with no imagination without telling myself a story i want to have a clean slate that's pure and clear and it's important to know that every thought that i have that i allow into my head is literally a lot of work to try to eradicate it. So I need to be very careful with the thoughts that I bring into my head. And I'm, I'll give you an example. Like when we have someone knocking at the door, right? We can A, ignore it and not, not even go to the door. B, we could open up the door and see who's standing there and decide, are we going to let them in or not let them in? Say, you know, this isn't a good time for me. Or we let them into the door. And at that point, I need to serve tea and coffee and cake. I need to serve coffee and cake at that point. I can't get the person out anymore. Letting um, a thought that's not positive, that's not helpful, a thought that's like um, demure note or stories that I tell to myself or jumping to conclusions about certain things, right? That's like allowing the person in and having to serve them a uh, cake or coffee. They're like almost they almost like imprison you because when we let them in, it, it imprisons us. So we want to stop the thoughts before they even get in, right? So how do we control unwanted thoughts? People are going to say, like, it's something I can't control. It just happened. Okay, but it's not true because um, we actually, when we open the door, we allow them in. And that's exactly what happens with the thoughts. It, they could only come in with our permission, right? It's like a muscle that I'm going to learn to control. Like a friend of mine was telling me she just had her seventh kid and she's been working with Michal Peretz for many years. She said at the beginning, I had when I had three, four kids, the whole nine months, I would dread the birth. I would be scared of it and panicky from it and have it go, be like I'd be reliving it and reliving it in my head. And the truth is all my births were never more than four hours and they went very smoothly. But because I, um, because I uh, was, constantly in my head playing and replaying the actual birth it made my nine months filled with fear and misery and anxiety and she said as i started to do this apoda i was able to train myself to um to, to strengthen the muscle of not allowing the thoughts in to realize that they are in my power to control it's like a muscle that we could control now the thoughts that i have in my head that is my reality the thoughts that i have in it, that, that, that's the reality like um i so so the, the worries of how she's going to grow and that i'm worried and i'm constantly future oriented with michali right and that there's darkness or you know there's no song in my mind but the feeling i have is a direct result of my thoughts because if someone just came over and told me i promise you that she will be 100% healed and cured. I know that all the good um, thoughts and the, the, the world will be vibrant and song will come back to my life. So, so if someone was to come and tell me, I promise you, I'd be, the, you know, I'd be happy and ecstatic, but no one is saying that. What is Hashem telling me at this point? Hashem telling me, I promise you, that I'm giving you the situation now today. And with that, I'm also giving you the exact amount of strength 
to deal with the current situation. I'm giving you the resources to be able to deal with your current situation. Like, like we, we, we say about Hashem, you know, who goes there, who he, he has a, a decree and he also keeps his promises. So there's a decree that came onto our family, but with that, God gave me strength for today to handle this decree. And at this moment, I have all the resources. But what happens when I sit at home or I wake up in the morning and my mind goes to the future? I don't have the resources. Hashem didn't give me the resources to deal with the future. Hashem gave me just the resources to deal with it in the here and now. In other words, um, if I want to be with Hashem, I need to be present in the present, realizing that today, now, what he gave me is exactly what I need to deal with now. And whatever is going to come later on, and I don't know what it is, he will give me the strength to deal with it then. But when I am constantly projecting myself into the future of what's going to be and how she's going to be and how she's going to survive and in school and her eyesight and her this and her that, because it didn't happen yet, God doesn't give me the strength to deal with it yet. So, so it's like, um, it's, I'm jumping the gun into something that may not happen that causes me anxiety and darkness and sadness and no song being in my head, as opposed to taking advantage of the current situation where Hashem gave me a sweet baby that once a week is on chemo and, and uh, is growing at a very slow rate. And with that today, I can handle, I can um, deal with, I could, um, I, I could be even, I would say I could be grateful for. So, um, that's why, that's why when in my head, I go to the future of, of the uncertainty and what happens, there is helplessness, there's fear and panic and terrible distress because I only have the strength that Hashem will give me now in the here and now. So what we need to do, we need to, you know how we take the draw and we sort and separate, we take everything out, we say, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be the draw for my socks. And we start picking up each sock and realizing, you know, this fits me, this is comfortable, this is uncomfortable, this, you know, um, is worn out, this I outgrew, et cetera. Like we, we sort and we separate. I need to sort and separate between the facts of the present and the fear of the future and the demyonot of the fears. And it's, it's okay, let's say to once in a while to like have your head go into it once in a while. But I need to tell myself, this isn't reality. This is a movie. And you know how when we watch a horror movie, um, when we watch a horror movie, our bodies totally constrict and we grab onto the people next to us and like we cover our eyes and we have a hard time, um, we have a hard time breathing or, um, and, and, and it raises, or let's say when we watch a sad movie, like tears start rolling down our cheeks and our heart is like all melting and, and, and there's a sadness that comes over us. So that is when we sit and watch a movie and we, we allow ourselves to go there for the hour and a half of the movie and then the movie stops and we, we continue on in life. When we project into the future, it's like we're creating a horror movie and our bodies tend, they, 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 they respond as if um, we are in a horror movie and we're constantly walking around tense and stressed and sad and and, um, you know, and, and anxiety ridden. So I need to, 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 to see my thoughts and tell myself what movie I am now currently watching, right? I'm, I'm sitting on the couch and, I'm, I'm, and, and I want to tell myself just the facts. Michal Levona woke up today and she ate, like the food was pumped through her and she did not throw up, she digested it. And her siblings played with her and she laughed and smiled and wanted to be picked up. And she slept and she went out for a walk with her mother on the carrier and like just, and she got her medication and the medication did good for her. And now she's even starting to stand up on her feet while she holds onto the couch. We need, I need to just say the 
facts only. Like my son just went and signed to a tour guiding course. This is after for already seven years, he's been looking for the kind of job he wanted and he wasn't sure and he looked here and he looked there. And, and it was like, how's he gonna make a living? How's he gonna support a family? Who's gonna wanna make, like all these thoughts that could go on in our heads. But I wanna sit down on my couch and say, he approached a tour guiding uh, course and he wants to sign up. That's a fact. My son has a desire to learn something so he'd be able to support a family but kavod. That is a fact. And I am not going to allow myself to live in a horror movie. So there are three things that we need to have in our head at all times. Three things. And, and those are th three things we're allowed to have in our head. One is just the facts. Facts, period. Period. Three, two, sorry, number two is my episode. What do I want? Like the fact is that Michali today is, you know, uh, like uh, with her siblings playing. That's on. what is my that's on? What is my that, that that's an, what is my that's on to go visit? Is my that's on to go cook? Is my that's on to go exercise? Is my that's what is my that's on? Is my that's on to say to Helene for her? Right? So one facts, two that's on. And the third thing is we need to give ourselves good feedback about ourselves, about our characteristics, about our development. We must constantly give ourselves positive feedback about who we are, right? Now, the more in our heads we say the facts, right? Just the facts. That's how our head is gonna be clean, like a white, pristine tissue. Our head is gonna be clean. And even if things are um, not going exactly according to what we want, our head is, is going to be clean thanks to that. And now where is God in this whole, this whole story? Where is Hashem? So I want to tell you that as Rav Kook, who was the first chief rabbi of Israel, said that our neshama is constantly talking to Hashem. Because it's part of Hashem, it's constantly having conversations in our head. It is a basic existential occurrence in our life at all times for everyone, that there's a conversation going on with God within us. However, most of the time we're not aware of it. And why not? Because our heads are filled with background noises. It's as if there's a white noise and it's filled with, um, and, and, and in the background there's, we're, we're unable to hear the voice of Hashem. Now, what is that background noise? What is the white noise that we hear? That's when we scare ourselves, when we imagine the worst, when we think what will be, when we're trying to fix things that it'll suit me, we don't hear that conversation. But if I start cleaning out these sentences of, I can't believe she didn't do this, or what was she thinking, or what is gonna be, or how are we gonna manage, or how is it gonna turn out, right? If I am able to clean these sentences and be in the present, I will have quiet in my head. And then I will be able to hear this ongoing conversation with the Bono Shalom, with God. So, so um, I want to reach a point, right? I want to reach a point where I will hear that conversation with God at all times. But it means that I need to stay in the hove, in the present, where the facts are. Now, um, this also happens that when our head and heart is in the same spot concurrently, at that moment, right, our head, like I'm now present where I am, just focusing on the facts that are around me now, that is called a moment of tefillah. That's a moment of prayer. And that is how um, we feel the connection between our mind and between our, our, our hearts and our bodies because usually our bodies and our heads are disconnected. My head is filled with the, what's gonna be in the future, what's gonna be the problems of the future, what's gonna arise, et cetera. And the Yetzir Hara is constantly um, trying to make sure that we're not gonna be in the same place, that our head is gonna be in the future or in the past, and our body is always in the present. And he sort of like is ripping them apart, is not enabling the, you know, our, our, our bodies and our minds to be synchronized in one place, and, and he had it made in the shade for us, right? So, so th those, the, the, the things that the Etzerah puts into us is doubts and fears 
and uncertainty and scary voices. And like, so, so, so really the last thing that I was gonna say is not the last thing for the class, but like, I want you to go back to the story of the pregnancy of my teacher that for many years, it was her whole nine months was, um, was filled with anxiety because of the last four hours of the giving birth. She wasn't able to enjoy her pregnancy. She wasn't able to enjoy the development of the embryo in her uterus and watching it grow and her body changed and, and, and because she was, because her head was in the future. And that's a total disconnect that we have our body to our mind and it does not able to be in tefillah. Now it says that the neshama constantly wants to be in tefillah. If we're able to say, to stay connected to the here and now, to what is happening just now in our lives, then we will start slowly hearing our neshama constantly, constantly praying. Because when we are so focused on the hove, on the present, um, all we can do is just be grateful about everything in the present. Grateful, like there was just a bomb in Israel, whatever, a rocket hit in Israel and, and, and someone was killed. However, I can say that yesterday, all day, trying to live in the present, I was just grateful every minute that, that whatever bombs were thrown, they didn't end up in, you know, people were not killed, um, people were not injured. Um, there, there were so many miracles that were happening. Um, there's every minute a minute there are things to be grateful about and that is the constant tefillah that our neshama is yearning now I wanted I wanted to read to you something um, from a man his name is Natan Me'il and I, as I read it I'm going to translate it he is a husband of a woman called Dafna Me'il where 10 years ago they, they okay so let's go back to 20 years ago 20 years ago um, Dafna her name was, and, and his name was Natan. They were both in the army together. Natan was a religious guy, and he met this um, young woman, and she was like a non-religious woman in the army, and they fell in love, and he told her, I really love you. Um, however, religion, God, is very important to me, and it's an important part of my life, and I'd like you to be able to study it and see, you know, if it's something that you'd be interested in, um, in incorporating into your life, and she went to learn, and she fell in love with Judaism after she learned and uh, they got married. And it turns out that she came from a broken family and her mother didn't take care of her. She grew up in orphanages. And um, when they got married, she was a nurse and he started to learn how to help people with addictions and pornography. And they had four children. After they had four children, they couldn't have any more. They adopted two foster kids with special needs. And I mean, first they were forced to kids and then they were adopted. They, they were kids with, uh, with special needs. And they lived in one of the settlements called Othniel, like maybe a half hour away from Efrat. 10 years ago, a, a terrorist came into the Yeshuv, came to their house and wanted to, uh, came with a knife. He wanted to murder the children and she stood in front of him and she protected her children. And as she held them off, she screamed to her daughter, go upstairs, call up Abba, call up the police. And then he ran away. She ended up dying at the doorstep of her house. And um, her husband was left, Natan was left with, um, she, she, she was a nurse dealing with infertility and taharata mishpacha. She ended up loving the halachot and loving to learn and wanting to make it easier for religious women to get pregnant. And of course, not religious women also, but religious women who are keeping the halachot of taharata mishpacha. So that was her forte, very, very high up in Israel. Um, and uh, it was a huge, huge loss when she was killed. And this father needed to deal with, you know, two special needs kids that they adopted, four children that saw the whole thing and were severely traumatized and he stopped working um, to take care of the family and just to rehab uh, the, the family, et cetera. Um, five years ago, he remarried and he has now three daughters from his new wife. And it was uh, a big process of rehabilitation for himself. So I want to just be... Um, this is something that very much moved me and I was able to, I was able to relate to it and it very much spoke to me. So the woman, the interviewer asked him, right? Um, how do you deal with such a tragic loss 
because it's something that just didn't happen then in the past. It's something that's continuously happening. Like you have to live with the ramification of these children that you adopted, that you're taking care of, your children that saw this, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I asked Natan, this is what the interview said, how do you get the strength and what are your anchors today? And he was quiet for a very long time. Just by the bit, by the way, he continued working with people who are dealing with pornography addiction and he's very successful. He developed his whole new shita. And now the reason they wrote the article about him is that um, major like professors and psychiatrists are coming to learn from him. How do you help um, people who are addicted to pornography specifically? So he, he was quite a long time when, when, when he was asked, what are your anchors? And the, 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 the question was like floating in the room, in, in the room. And he said, I have no anchors. I decided that I'm going to live without anchors. He, he finally answered. And I don't get my strength. I agree to live without strength. I agree to smash every day anew, to be disappointed and to disappoint and to be frustrated. God is like telling me, you have to be careful from holding strong enough, from holding too tight in this world, because this world is not a secure world. And he says, a Jew is not supposed to lean on the earth. He's supposed to lean on the heaven. And as much as you agree to relinquish your anchors, that is how you stand more and more in front of Hashem, because that's all there is. God is in the cracks and he's not in the wide open plain. Okay. So I read it this Shabbat and um, I read it this Shabbat and the words really, I, I, I have it by my bed and I've been reading and rereading it because the words very much, um, they very much echo what I was trying to do and what I'm trying to um, wean myself off. I was trying to grab onto certainty, like trying to plant ourselves in the earth to become well-rooted, um, to have certainties. You know, we feel solid and we feel secure and we feel like, you know, nothing could touch us or hurt us. The things are not going to go wrong. And, and when I was trying to hold onto these certainties and I wasn't getting it, my, my days were filled with no song in my head and, and a more dimming of the light of my day. However, when I was willing to say, you know what? There's no piece of ground that's safe under my feet. I'm not gonna hold on to the ground. I'm gonna hold on to heaven. I'm gonna hold on to Shemaim. I'm gonna hold on to God. And holding on to him is the most secure thing I can do. Holding on to him means living in the present, living in the now. And, um, and, 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 and like he said, like uh, Leonard Cohen writes, first of all, there, there's two things. Le Leonard Cohen wrote a song that when a vessel breaks and try to put it together, you see the lights through the cracks. So I see God's light through the cracks. And in Japan, I, I mean, I think this is very well known when, a, when a, a precious vase would break, they would put it together with gold and in other words, where the cracks is, that is where the gold, that is where we, that is our most, most precious resource to be able to fill the cracks with gold, to be able to fill the cracks with the ability of staying in the present, of allowing my neshama, my head and my heart and my body to be one and allowing myself to hear the song of my neshama, which is a continual prayer to Hashem. Okay, thank you for being with me. I'm putting it on pause and I wanna hear if there's any questions. So now we are in the holiday, we're, we're heading for the holiday of Matan Torah. And we recently had Lagba Omer and Lagba Omer is considered the Chag of the Pnimiyut Torah. Pnimiyut Torah is the, under the surface of the Torah. So it's like we have the ocean that we see on top, which is the Torah, which is, clear and everyone's able to see on top of the ocean you see the boats and you see the people gliding and swimming on top of the ocean but there's a whole world under the ocean that is not visible to the eye that you need to like really dive in it's called um the secret Torah um okay guys 
I am going to continue this, this class next week because I just saw a message from Malka. I have medication in my house that needs to go to Michalivona and there's a person that was found that's uh, driving up. 